Okay. In one of the text boxes there on your handout, I am giving you this mechanism. This is the pathway of a certain reaction. And if this really is a mechanism like I'm telling you it is, then these reactions are each what kind of reaction? Elementary. What kind of reaction is the first step? Unimolecular, bimolecular, or termolecular? Bimolecular. There's two reactant molecules involved. And what about the second step? Also bimolecular. You got this guy and this guy, two reactant molecules involved. Okay. So, got a couple of questions for you. First is, if this is the mechanism, then what is the overall reaction? What is the overall reaction? Well, add up all the steps and you get the overall reaction. And so what you do is you add up all the reactants and put them on one giant reaction reactant side. Add up all the products and put them on the other side. Anything that shows up on both sides cancels. And so what am I going to be left with for an overall balanced reaction here? That's your overall reaction. And so notice, if you're just given, if you were just given this last part right here, you couldn't figure out a rate law from this because you don't know if it's elementary. And it turns out it's not elementary. It gets broken down into simpler steps, it turns out. Question. So why is there just one H2? So why is there just one? So if you look here, there's a little dash here. This means these are connected to each other. They're bonded to each other. So you have H2 and PT joined together. They're bonded to each other right here. So, and then once they're bonded together, then those react with C2H4, producing C2H6, but then your platinum gets spit back out. So you start with platinum and it gets used up, but then it gets reproduced at the end. That way, it doesn't appear in the overall reaction. It was a reactant and a product. And so it falls out of the balanced reaction. What else fell out of the balanced reaction? The H2PT complex here also fell out of it. So when things don't show up in the overall reaction, they're one of two things. They're either a catalyst or an intermediate. So and you should be able to identify them from a mechanism like this, both the catalyst and the intermediate. So let's start with a catalyst. So a catalyst is something you start out with and it gets used up for a time, but before the reaction's over, you're gonna get it back out. It does not get consumed overall in the reaction. So who's my catalyst? Yeah, your PT here is your catalyst. So notice your catalyst is a reactant first and a product second. And you can remember that by saying crap. So a catalyst is a reactant first and a product second. I bring that up because what's the intermediate in this case? H2PT is an intermediate. It's a product first and then a reactant. So an intermediate, you don't start out with it and you don't end up with it. It's only present in the middle of the reaction. In fact, that's what intermediate means. Intermediate means in the middle. So in this case, again, the H2PT was intermediate and again, the platinum was the catalyst. And you should be able to recognize either one of those from a mechanism. Now, not all mechanisms are going to have a catalyst, but most mechanisms do have intermediates. Cool. So from a mechanism, you should be able to get the overall reaction, and you should be able to identify any catalysts and any intermediates. Cool. The other text box, I am going to leave alone, so as it's beyond the scope of what you guys are learning. There is one thing you need to know, though. So if I have many steps in a reaction, which one is the one that we call the rate determining step or the rate limiting step? Slow step. Sweet, the slow step. So what you guys don't know is that I'm, a, I'm an Olympic athlete. You may not believe me. I don't believe me either. So, but I'm an Olympic athlete, and I'm running a new event in the Olympics. It is the co-ed 4x4 relay. So two men, two women, 4x4 relay. So what is your name? Nargis. Nargis is on my relay team. So, and what is your name? Tim. Tim is also on my relay team. So we were trying to find an anchor. So we got me and Tim going. We got Nargis, and then we're like, need another girl. We need, you know, Olympic athlete, right? So we got Nargis's little sister to join us. Now, Tim ran his quarter mile in 51 seconds. Nice, good speed to run a quarter mile. Nargis, 52 seconds. Another amazing speed. Now I'm a little old. 
And so when I ran it in 50 seconds and beat both of them, it was kind of embarrassing for them. But I got it 50 seconds, doing really well. But our anchor, we got Nargis' little sister. And what I failed to mention is that Nargis' little sister is 18 months old. Probably not the best choice for our Olympic anchor. So, and we sent her out last Friday before the weekend to run her quarter mile. I called your mom, she's almost done. So it's taken her three days to run her quarter mile and she's almost done. How long is our entire one mile relay gonna take then? Three days and a little less than three minutes, right? I think I can really hit the weights hard, hit the track hard and get my time down to like 49 or 48 seconds. How will that impact the overall rate of our relay team? Not much. You know, one or two seconds compared to three day length overall doesn't do anything for me. If we want to affect the rate of this relay, where do we have to focus? On replacing Nargis' dumb little sister. That's right. We're all mad at her. So that's the deal. The slow step is the rate determining step because it's so much longer than all the other steps. It pretty much sets the rate of the whole reaction. That's the idea of why the slow step is the rate determining step. So that's what you needed to take away from there. Um, let's talk a little more about a catalyst. What's a catalyst? Speeds up a chemical reaction. How does it do that? How does it speed up the chemical reaction? Lowers the activation energy. Awesome. How does it lower the activation energy? Uh, sometimes it does that. So, but the idea is this. It lowers the activation energy by taking a completely different pathway than the original reaction. It's still going from the same place to the same place, same reactant, same products, but it's taking a different pathway. So let's say this is actually my fifth review session in six days and I'm tired. So, and I decide, you know what? At the end of this week, I'm just going skiing. I'm going skiing, getting out of here, getting out of town, and I'm going skiing. And so I'm gonna go up to Snowbowl and Flagstaff and go skiing. Is it gonna work out well for me this weekend? No, it's gonna work out less well than you realize. So, cause I'm not the sharpest tool in the tool shed. So I'm going to Snowball this weekend and I get on I-10 and I head south. And then I get to Tucson and I switch freeways and I continue heading south. And then I get to Nogales and I'm at the border. And before I cross the border and I'm waiting in line, I buy some chicle, but then I cross the border and I head south. And I go all the way down through Mexico. I get to Central America, and I stop for a couple days in Costa Rica because it's really nice. But then I keep heading south. I cross over into Panama, over the Panama Canal, go down through Brazil, and get all the way to the southern tip of Argentina, and I catch a ferry. We go by the Falkland Islands, hit Antarctica, and I start driving, and I keep heading south. And then I get to the South Pole. And because I'm at the very bottom of the globe on the South Pole, I can't go south anymore, and I have to go North, anywhere you go on the South Pole is north, right? So I go back up the entire backside of the globe, spend another two weeks of my journey, and I finally reach the North Pole. And now that I'm at the North Pole, I can once again head south, sweet. And I go through the Arctic, I get into Canada, cross over into Montana, cross over into Idaho, and then into Nevada, Utah. And after six weeks, I finally make it to Snowball. They're still not going to have a snow in six weeks, right? So, but I get to Snowball, and I'm like, dude, there's no snow. And I call my friend Dan. I'm like, dude, there's no snow in Snowball. And Dan's like, are you going skiing again, Chad? Didn't you go six weeks ago and find out there was no snow? Are you an idiot? I'm like, no, no, this is the same trip. Dude, Antarctica's cold. So, and Dan's like, what are you talking about? Snowball is two hours north on I-17. I'm like, no way, really? Dan is acting as a catalyst a human catalyst. He is giving me an alternate pathway that takes a whole lot less energy and will therefore be faster so to get from exactly the same place to the same place. So again, that's a catalyst. It f speeds up a reaction by lowering the activation energy by giving an alternate pathway. So one thing to note, we showed this just a minute ago. Platinum was our catalyst. A catalyst is not consumed overall in the reaction. It gets used up for a time, but then it gets spit back out. It gets regenerated before the reaction's over. And that's why a little bit of catalyst goes a long way, because a little catalyst catalyzes one reaction and then does it again and again and again. And one little catalyst can catalyze a reaction over and over and over and over and over and over, and over again. That's why like a little, you know, a little bit of CFCs chews up a lot of ozone, because it's catalytic. 
a little CFC just chews up ozone over and over and over and over and over again, it turns out, in some sort of catalytic process. All right, um, cool. One more thing to talk about with a catalyst. What is a biological catalyst? So it's an enzyme. It's an enzyme, which is a type of protein. Not the only type of protein, but the most prominent type of protein. So Tim, it is Tim still, right? Sweet. Tim is a human catalyst. And what you don't know about Tim is I take Tim out to Subway every Friday. So, and I buy him a foot-long sub. And every Friday, Tim converts that foot-long sub. And in Saturday morning, he converts it into a foot-long turd. Every Saturday, without fail. And he does this over and over and over again, week after week after week. He does not get consumed in the process. Sub after sub after sub. Thanks, Tim. <laughs> so we're going to look at what's called a reaction coordinate diagram. We typically plot energy on the y-axis and just what we call the reaction coordinate on the x-axis. So and simply, we just follow the reactants and products, their energies, as the reaction proceeds from start to finish. So first thing is that the difference in energy between the reactants and products on a graph like this is delta H. So this difference in energy right here is delta H. Now in this reaction that I've got diagrammed here, is delta H positive or negative? Is it increasing or decreasing? It's increasing. So that's a positive delta H. And so what kind of reaction is this one in particular? It's endothermic. When delta H is positive, endothermic. And that's indicative that the products end up higher in energy than your reactants. If we would have reversed this, that would be exothermic. OK. So but it turns out, energetically, you don't go in a straight line from reactants to products. Every reaction has a hill, energetic hill, an energy barrier to cross. So and from where you start to the top of the hill, what do we call that? That's your activation energy. So E sub A, the activation energy. And you can look at the activation energy both in the forward direction, but you could also look at the reaction going backwards, and that would be the activation energy in the reverse direction. Cool. So if I told you that the forward activation energy here was 100 kilojoules, and I told you the reverse activation energy was 60 kilojoules, then what question could I ask you? I could say, what is the enthalpy change? What's delta H? And what is delta H in this case? It's 40, and it's positive 40. Notice, had this been exothermic, you'd have had to figure out that it would have been, you know, I mean, actually, what if I said, What's the enthalpy change of the reverse reaction? How's that? Well, that's negative 40. So just going the opposite way. It's going downhill when you go backwards. OK, great. So the difference in the activation energies can help you get the enthalpy change of the reaction. All right, a couple other things you need to know about these reaction coordinate diagrams. We got our reactant here. We got our product here. So but what do we call what it looks like way at the top of the hill here? Now, we usually use this double dagger symbol to represent it. So, and we call that the transition state. It's the most common name. And whereas transition state is the most common name, it's not the only name. The other thing we might call this thing is an activated complex. So transition state or activated complex, same diff. All right. We've got this reaction here. If I added a catalyst, what a catalyst might do effectively is that. So it takes a totally different pathway. Instead of this big, huge activation energy pathway, it takes this lovely pathway in green. And the activation energy is lower, which is why it proceeds more quickly, faster rate. Here's the deal, though. Notice my catalyst doesn't just lower the activation energy in the forward direction, it also lowers it going back. That's really important. As a result, the equilibrium does not get shifted. We'll talk about equilibrium in the next chapter. But it does not shift in equilibrium to the left or right at all when you add a catalyst. So what if I had a reaction that had already reached equilibrium and I added a catalyst? What would be the effect of the catalyst? It would actually have no effect. A catalyst helps you get to equilibrium faster, but it won't shift the equilibrium at all. So if you're already at equilibrium, you're done. Adding a catalyst accomplishes nothing. So again, 
you got to know your definition of catalyst. A catalyst speeds up a reaction by lowering the activation energy by giving an alternate mechanism or pathway for the reaction to occur. It does not get consumed in the reaction, and it does not shift the equilibrium towards the reactants or towards the products at all. Just want to show you one other reaction coordinate diagram. So you might see a reaction coordinate diagram looking like the second one here. How is this mechanism different than the first one? To what? Two transition states, that's true. And why are there two transition states? Because there are two steps. There are two steps. For this first reaction, if you only have one hill, one transition state, that's only one step reaction. But Two hills, two transition states. So, but we also get something else in this, react, in this diagram here. What else will I have to label? Intermediate, right there. So between your transition states, that minimum right there is an intermediate. And so a big difference here is that an intermediate can actually be isolated. You can freeze a reaction, if you will, and catch some intermediate right there. But you can't freeze a reaction and ever isolate transition states. They are not isolatable. You can't isolate them. So you can't be like, hey, I got a bottle of transition state over here. Never happens. You can't do it. <laughs>